Hi everyone, I am Dr. Ramakrishna Chaitanya, your anesthesia faculty, consultant anesthesiologist and a critical care specialist. So welcome to this module of clinical weakness anesthesia. So let us start the first question. A 32 year old male patient, 32 year old patient, male patient was scheduled for excision of small bone cyst. They have, what they have done is they wanted uh, to do excision of small bone cyst at the distal end of radius okay the procedure was scheduled under total intravenous regional anesthesia okay again this is the case of total intravenous regional anesthesia during the procedure the patient suddenly became unresponsive okay so most of my patients whatever the complications that occur in anesthesia where the patient will be condition will be critical right the patient suddenly became unresponsive with the following rhythm on the monitor so what is that rhythm what you are seeing on the monitor so everyone knows that rhythm that rhythm is typical of ventricular fibrillation this is the rhythm is a typical of ventricular fibrillation. So what has happened here? So let us see what are the things that has happened in this second question. So the second question is a case of intravenous regional anesthesia where the patient has landed into one dangerous complication that is ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation. Right. So, where do we use this intravenous regional anesthesia? So, this intravenous regional anesthesia, in other words, it is known as buyer's block also. So, what we are doing in this intravenous regional anesthesia, already I have discussed it in the, uh, what we call it as theory section. So, what we do is we tie a tourniquet on the patient two tourniquet will be actually tied to the patient we inflate the tourniquet we keep an iv line into the patient's hand we inject the local anesthetic over there so that the whole hand will become numb after few minutes the whole hand will become numb so the key point is this is called as intravenous regional anesthesia where i am blocking the whole limb by just giving a drug intravenously so what are the uh, where do i have to use this intravenous regional anesthesia it is used for small procedures on extremities small procedures on extremities the question itself is saying it says bone cyst excision on the radius small bone cyst that is exciser so it's a daycare procedure so intravenous regional anesthesia preferably it is used for daycare anesthesia because you know it's a very simple easy to administer you can discharge the patient after the procedure is over so it's a small procedure so at the peripheries you can use it so where what are the disadvantages of this procedure is or what are the complications you can expect is whenever the tourniquet get loosened whenever the tourniquet that is get loosened the patient can land up into local anesthesia toxicity local anesthesia toxicity just now in the previous question i was telling you right now we will understand the management of local anesthesia toxicity now why i kept this is in neat pg 2020 sorry 2020 they asked a question how do you manage ventricular arrhythmia so that's the reason why i kept this uh, what is the drug of choice something like that they have asked so that's the reason why i kept this question okay so first thing you have to understand is this is a procedure where the complications are expected and here the complication that is coming is ventricular fibrillation so what are the complications how do a patient present with local anesthesia toxicity is presenting so this local anesthesia toxicity as i said you so let us put this heading like this complications the complications can be grouped into three categories the complications can be grouped into three categories the first one is systemic toxicity systemic toxicity which we'll discuss now right the second one is local injury to the nerves local injury to the nerves in the form of injury whenever you put a tourniquet there can be chances of neuroparaxia neuroparaxia right the third one is allergic reactions the local anesthesia can be presented with these kind of complications allergic reactions right so here this is a typical scenario of systemic toxicity in systemic toxicity the patient can present with the patient can present with one is cns symptoms the second one is cvs symptoms 
द पेशेंट कैन प्रेजेंट विद ईदर सी एन एस सिम्टम्स और विद सी एफ सी वी एस सिम्टम्स है सो वॉट आर द सी एन एस सिम्टम्स जस्ट नो आई टोल यू द सी एन एस सिम्टम्स आर सीजर्स द पेशेंट टिपिकली कंप्लेन्स ऑफ टिंगलिंग एंड नमनेस अराउंड द माउथ सर्क मोरल टीनीटस फ्लैशनिंग ऑफ द लाइट इेलिवेंट टॉकिंग इनकोहरेंट टॉकिंग इनवॉलेंट्री मूवमेंट्स ऑफ द अपर लिम्स लोअर लिम्स एंड इफ द ड्रग इज कंटिन्यू टू अब्सर्व सिस्टमिकली द पेशेंट विल थ्रो ए जी टी सी एस और जनरलाइज टोनिक क्लोनिक कन्वर्शन आई एम नाइट नॉट राइटिंग ऑल दीज थिंग्स बट सिंपली आई एम पुटिंग इट एज सीजर्स वॉट इज द मोस्ट कामन ड्रग विच कैन बी कॉजिंग सीजर्स इज लिग्नोकेन लिग्नोकेन राइट सो टिंगलिंग एंड नमनेस लाइट हेडेडनेस सरकम बोरल टीनिटस दे माइट गिव यू एनी डिस्क्रिप्शन वेन वी आर टॉकिंग और वेन वी आर पुटिंग दिस दिस वन राइट देन कमिंग टू द सी वी एस कॉम्प्लिकेशन वॉट आर द सी वी एस कॉम्प्लिकेशन दैट यू कैन एक्सपेक्ट अ वेरी डेंजरस कॉम्प्लिकेशन इज वेंट्रिकुलर फिब्रिलेशन दिस इज ए सीनेरियो ऑफ वेंट्रिकुलर फिब्रिलेशन माई होल पॉइंट इज नॉट टू गिव यू अ डायग्नोसिस बट हाउ टू अप्रोच दिस डिसीज सो एज वी ऑल नो लोकल अनस्थेटिक्स आर सोडियम चैनल ब्लॉकर्स दे कैन कॉज कंडक्शन ऑफ नॉर्मेलिटीज दे कैन कॉज मयो कार्डियल डिप्रेशन एंड अरिथीमियास एंड कार्डियाक अरेस्ट सो सिंपली पुटिंग इट विल कॉज वेंट्रिकुलर अरिथीमियास मोर कॉमनली वेंट्रिकुलर फिब्रिलेशन इज सेम सो वॉट शुड आई डू विद दिस कॉम्प्लिकेशन फर्स्ट वन इज सीजर्स इफ ए पेशेंट इज एक्टिवली थ्रोइंग सीजर्स वॉट शुड आई डू सो फर्स्ट स्टेप वॉट आई विल डू इज I will stop injecting the local anesthetics. Stop injecting local anesthetic. This is a very key step. If you are continuing the local anesthetic injection, please stop this. This is the first step because you know of late many questioners, many examiners are asking what is the immediate step in management. So many of the students, you know, immediate step if they give you stop injecting the local anesthetic. This is very very important. Okay, if you continue, there are many other options. You all know it. Midazolam can be given, or if it is ventricular fibrillation, intralipid can be given. But the systematic approach of a complication is the first stop injecting the local anesthetic. Second one is call for help. What we do is you can't manage, you can't be hero all the times, right? You might require second help also. Whenever a patient is collapsing, second one is call for help. No one will ask you this question. The third one is this is a case of seizure. So what you have to do is maintain the airway. as i said you maintain the airway maintain the airway airway breathing circulation especially in a seizure patient because you know if there is hypoxia hypercarbia and acidosis one seizure episode will lead to second third fourth so it can put it into status epilepticus i have to control the seizure so first thing what i will do is i will maintain the airway provide 100% oxygen provide 100% percent oxygen to my patient okay so then what i will do i have stopped injecting the drug there is an intravenous access that is there then what i will do is quickly i will give a short acting short acting benzodiazepine which is present on my operation table than the balls machine that is midazolam midazolam so many students they ask me this question sir now while diazepam lorazepam no all these they might take some type nizepam is an outdated drug lorazepam also if you look at the pharmacology so what will happen is midazolam is a very quick onset of the drug very very quick onset of the drug when compared to lorazepam yes lorazepam is slightly longer acting midazolam is short acting drug but the onset of action is very quick so i want to stop the seizure immediately so what i will do is i will give midazolam for the patient and what will happen is most of the times the dosage what i give 1 mg 2 mg 3 mg of the midazolam if i give to my patient what will happen is most of the times the patient can go into respiratory depression but i am trained to hold the airway i am trained trained to hold the or manage the airway so what i will do is i will hold the mask in a triple maneuver position and continue ventilating the patient or in my armentarium i have got wonderful drugs on my ot table on my boils machine what are the drugs like thiopentone sodium propofol etc so i can use any of the drug like thiopentone sodium propofol but preferably first option would be midazolam only no one will give you in your examination they will give you thiopentone propofol midazolam no no one will give you but even if they give you the first one what will come into my mind is i'll take midazolam and i'll push the midazolam into the patient's body so that the seizures are immediately stopped 
okay so same even i can use thiopentone sodium propofol so what will happen is the patient will have control of the seizures and second thing what i will do is as these drugs are depressants they i need to maintain the airway so most of the times what i will do is i will intubate the patient I will intubate the patient and continue mechanical ventilation till the effect of local anesthesia in the form of seizures are reduced. So what I will do is whenever I am uh, whenever I am giving ventilation, I will do slight amount of hyperventilation. I will do slight amount of hyperventilation. Now you might get a doubt. Like why are we doing hyperventilation for this patient? So why I am doing hyperventilation is this will reduce my CO2 levels. Already I have told you, I think this will reduce because if you are hyperventilating a patient, this will reduce your CO2 levels and this decreases cerebral blood flow. If it is decreasing my cerebral blood flow, what will happen is, see here, beautifully, the drug reaching the CNS will be reduced. Drug reaching CNS will be reduced. That's the reason why I don't want seizures. I want to control the seizures because if I don't control the seizures, the patient will go into, quickly go into permanent neurological damage. This is how I manage a patient with seizures. Okay. So, in this meanwhile, not only this, I will look at the cardiovascular system also. And if there are some problems that are arising from the cardiovascular system side, I will continue management on that direction. Okay, so this is how I manage a patient with seizures. Right. The second one is ventricular fibrillation. How I am managing ventricular fibrillation? Again, the same, same steps that will be continuing. Stop injecting the local anesthetic. The same step. I will mark it here. Same stop injecting. Second one is very, very important in ventricular fibrillation. Call for help. Second one is call for help. What is the important thing you have to give is the important drug in management of this patient is 20% intralipid. So, what is the important drug in management of the patient with ventricular arrhythmias is 20% intralipid. But remember, before I start giving intralipid, the first step what I have to do is start CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This is very, very important. Start doing chest compressions because this patient is having ventricular fibrillation and ventricular fibrillation means no pulse. That means if you fail to start CPR, immediately the vital organs perfusion will be damaged. So immediately start CPR. Don't waste the time in getting the lintralipid etc. The first thing is jump and start doing CPR because you have called for the help. Someone will tell get the intralipid for you and then in this process you can administer intralipid to the patient. While doing, uh, while administering the intralipid also, you have to continue CPR. You have to continue CPR. This is very, very important. And if the patient, the rhythm is not getting under control, even you can consider giving DC shock. Right. So even you can consider giving the DC shock for this patient. So very, very important in this patient with cardiovascular collapse. CVS system collapse is giving 20% intralipid to the patient and while doing the while giving the intralipid also you have to continue the CPR sometimes it might take around one hour for us for me uh, to recover throughout that period monitor and continue the CPR if the rhythm is not achieved please go for DC shock and all the ACLS protocol that is advanced cardio uh, cardiac life support protocol should be continued to the patient very very important is in advanced cardiac life support generally we recommend as an anti-arrhythmic lignocaine but here as it is lignocaine as it is a local anesthesia toxicity because of happening due to bupivacaine we all know it but what will happen is i don't prefer lignocaine here it's not guideline what they are saying but generally we don't give lignocaine for this patient so we continue cpr we give dc shock we give adrenaline we give 20 percent intralipid is very very important because most of the times the patient will be the arrhythmias can be controlled with this uh, intralipid administration only right the second the next important thing is uh, 
even some patients or some students they read it somewhere but you know this is not i have not told you anywhere but some students they have messaged me can i use propofol because it also contain fat emulsion again propofol is not recommended propofol is not recommended okay this is not recommended 20 percent intralipid means 20 percent intralipid only should be given so somewhere some student has asked me that's the reason why i have kept this one so intravenous regional anesthesia the systemic toxicity can be presenting with in two forms it can be a cns toxicity or it can be due to cvs toxicity now i will add one more word here yes i am talking about systemic toxicity right so in systemic toxicity suppose if the given drug is prelocane if the given drug is prelocaine, it will cause methemoglobinemia. Methemoglobinemia. Because what are the drugs that are approved for intravenous regional anesthesia? The drugs that are approved are lignocaine and prelocaine. Lignocaine and prelocaine. Drugs which are not approved for intravenous anas regional anesthesia are bupivacaine, ropivacaine, etc. Because these are cardiotoxic drugs. And I have told you many times that the arrhythmias that are induced by bupivacaine, they are very resistant for the treatment. Okay. So, prelocaine, it is causing methemoglobinemia because prelocaine, when it gets metabolized in your body, it produces orthotoluidin. This will cause methemoglobinemia. What is methemoglobinemia? You all know that the iron in hemoglobin is converted from Fe plus 2 to Fe plus 3 form. So, the saturation, what will happen is the saturation will be falsely, SpO2 will be falsely low value falsely low value so remember in local anesthesia toxicity majorly two systems are affected one is cns other one is cvs what is the system that is exclusive or a unique addition is prelocane toxicity which causes methemoglobinemia and one more systemic toxicity of local anesthetic not related to this question again i am specifying not related to this question but if there is cocaine poisoning Cocaine is also a local anesthetic. Nowadays, it's not available. If there is cocaine poisoning, the patient will present because cocaine is the only local anesthetic which causes sympathetic stimulation, which causes sympathetic stimulation. So, whenever a patient presents with cocaine toxicity, there will be severe vasoconstriction, severe vasoconstriction leading to MI leading to MI. The patient complain of severe chest pain, angina like chest pain because of severe vasoconstrictor effects of the cocaine. The treatment is nitroglycerin. The treatment is nitroglycerin. Not related. Last two are not related to this scenario. Just to conclude that topic. So, what I told you is the first one is systemic toxicity. In the systemic toxicity, majorly affected is CNS and CVS. The second complications what I can expect in any patient with local anesthesia while I am administering the patient local anesthesia or through intravenous regional anesthesia is neuroparaxia. So, neuroparaxia the patient complains of weakness post-operatively if there is any nerve injury the patient complain of weakness cannot lift the hand cannot eat the food something like that he will complain so no way this is related to our question just to finish off what are the complications we are expecting local nerve injury that can occur the next one is very very important allergic reactions how do a patient presents with allergic reactions again as i said you what are the most common cause of allergens? The most commonly caused agents which can provoke allergic reactions are anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock. So, I discussed it in the routine video section. Okay. One is antibiotics. Very commonly known to cause. The second one is latex which is present in your gloves, IV tubing, everywhere in the operation theater. The third one is neuromuscular blockers. The fourth one is local anesthetics. In local anesthetics, especially ester type of local anesthetics. Ester type of local anesthetics are known to cause allergic reactions. Now, how do a patient present? Sometimes, you know, they might give you some scenario where you might get confused between a seizure and an allergic reaction. So, if you have read the videos properly, you will not get, never get confused. Allergic reactions is present. Eh? Clinical presentation is sudden unexplained tachycardia sudden unexplained tachycardia hypotension hypotension 
increased airway resistance. The patient will complain of difficulty in breathing. Complains of difficulty in breathing. Difficulty in breathing. That's very, very important. Or you can see the patient's face has swollen. Or you can see the laryngeal edema or the facial edema of the patient. That's very, very important. So, allergic reactions, they present with hypotension, increased airway resistance. If the patient is under general anesthesia, difficulty in putting the or ventilating the patient also. Okay, so what is the treatment for allergic reactions? Just to conclude of the complication, the treatment is most commonly the drug of choice is adrenaline. Again, the same first step remains same. If you are injecting local anesthetic, stop giving the local anesthetic. The second one is what is the drug of choice? Adrenaline. Drug of choice is adrenaline. How much amount of adrenaline? 1 is to 10,000. Already we have discussed it. IV. This is the first preferred mode because 100% Bavaya availability will be there. So first one is uh, 1 is to 10,000. Suppose if uh, it is not available, 1 ml of 1 is to 10,000 or if it is 0.5 ml of 1 is to 1000. Subcutaneously or intramuscularly also. Not a big thing. Okay. So I generally prefer because I am an anesthetist, I want to put an IV line and I want to dilute the adrenaline and give it 1 ml of the drug. This will take care of the patient. So please try to understand. The whole point of putting these questions is to understand the complications that can arise due to local anesthesia and how we are managing. Why I kept this question? In 2020, there was a question on local anesthesia systemic toxicity. What is the drug of choice? You know, if they want to put a clinical basis in area, they can put on these lines. So hopefully this should help you in answering this kind of questions. See the next question. A 68 year old person 100 kg patient is undergoing transurethral resection of prostate gland very very important mcq transurethral that is turpo procedure transurethral resection of prostate gland due to benign prostatic hyperplasia under general anesthesia okay very very important under general anesthesia the patient is having uh, transurethral resection of prostate upon arrival into the recovery room the patient appears restless very commonly seen scenario the patient appears restless and confused the patient appears restless and confused what is the reason for this complication and how to manage this complication that's what the question is right so what is the most common cause here what 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 is the most third question what we are discussing is a patient with turp syndrome the patient with turp that is transurethral resection of the prostate eh? so this patient is appearing confused and you know the patient is not uh, in a confused state or in an irritable state what could be the management of this uh, what could be the differential diagnosis of it let us see why a patient will be in a confused state after general anesthesia. This is very, very important. So the patient could be due to the first reason that should be coming should be due to hypoxia. The first common cause any patient coming into the post-operative uh, area in a confused state immediately after shifting the patient is irritable, confused, unresponsive. The first thing that should strike into your mind is hypoxia. The second thing is due to hypercarbia. The third thing is due to pain. After general anesthesia, third thing is due to pain. Or the patient can have any metabolic abnormalities. Metabolic abnormalities. The patient can be having any metabolic abnormalities. Now, this is very, very important for us. Here, the question they are specifically asking about transurethral resection of the prostate. So, what happens in transurethral resection of the prostate? If you have attended your postings, eh, anesthesia postings or, you know, any surgical postings also, you will be understanding that this is a special posting. You, they might have taught you in your surgery, but this is exclusive complication of anesthesia. Right. So in transurethral resection of the prostate, what will happen is this is generally done in benign prostatic hyperplasia where we will be continuously irrigating the bladder whenever we are resecting the prostate. So continuously irrigating. 
irrigating the bladder irrigating the bladder while we are resecting the prostate gland so what will happen is because the prostate gland is rich in venous plexus sometimes the glands the venous plexus open and there is systemic absorption systemic absorption of the irrigating fluid this is very very important you know you might not have seen you might not have seen this kind of cases but remember because you know as an uh, intern i am not expecting you to know this but this is a very common complication in anesthesia or very common complications of turf surgery also so there is a systemic absorption of the irrigating fluid leading to fluid overload fluid overload leading to fluid overload what will happen if there is a fluid overload that is happening to the patient so this fluid overload actually what it will do is it will cause hyponatremia or hypernatremia very very important hyponatremia they might have told you or you are very intelligent student i know it so whatever when we are talking about sodium if there is something which is related to sodium that means that is related to water so if the water is excess that means values of sodium are very very low if the water is very very low that means the values of sodium are very very high so this is a typical case when a patient is scheduled for turp procedure and he is having post operative confusion or during surgery also if the patient is having confusion irritability so what is the first thing we are suspecting he is fluid overload because of the systemic absorption of the fluids leading to hyponatremia very very important how bad is hyponatremia what are the normal levels of hyponatremia i know you all are very thorough in your medicine knowledge but just i will add a point so the normal value is around 135 to 145 milli equivalent so i am not worried if it is reduced up to 130 also i am not worried about if the values of sodium is reduced to 130 also but if it is reduced to less than 120 milli equivalent so i am worried why the patient will present with by this time the volume of fluid overload will be so much the patient will present with high volume overload volume overload or fluid overload or the patient will present with hypotension congestion or congestive heart failure like symptoms the patient will complaining of dyspnea etc but if the values still drop down to 115 milli equivalents what will happen you know the qrs waves will become widened the qrs waves will become widened there will be t wave inversions sometimes you can see the t wave inversions will be there and the patients will have ventricular ectopics the patient will have ventricular ectopics and if it is very less than 100 milli equivalents the patient will have cardiac arrest these are just approximate values no one will ask you at what value the patient will have but any symptomatic presentation of any patient here the patient will have values less than 120 milli equivalents in turp syndromes in fluid overload slight amount of change in the sodium values nothing will happen during the surgery or post operatively also but if there is a large fluctuation in the sodium values that means especially the symptoms start showing when the sodium values drop down to a very low values of 120 and that too this is in acute phase remember there is a difference between acute presentation and chronic presentation i am least interested about chronic presentation i am interested about acute presentation because my patient had general anesthesia now here the key word is general anesthesia why general anesthesia you know if it is under generally we don't do it under general anesthesia if it is under spinal anesthesia the first thing the patient will complain is confusion irritability he will not cooperate during the surgery this is very very important but here he specifically mentioned in general anesthesia and the patient shifted to post operative ward so if it is general anesthesia the patient cannot complain of confusion irritability etc so as the sodium levels are decreasing in your body at 125 126 you will become irritable you will not be cooperative for surgery so generally we prefer spinal anesthesia but here the question is asked general anesthesia that's the reason why the symptoms and signs they are presented in the post operative period so the symptoms and signs the patient is having confusion and irritability and it can be due to hypoxia i don't say but here the question is targeted towards turp syndrome 
the question is targeted toward turbo that is transurethral resection of prostate so most common is metabolic abnormality that is due to hyponatremia there can be hypoglycemia there can be hypercarbia there can be pain etc but here it is specifically pointing towards the metabolic abnormality that is hyponatremia so what will you do now how do you manage this patient management suppose if it is during surgery if the patient becomes irritability what is the first step why i am putting this one is first step is stop surgery you stop your surgeon to do the surgery generally what we do is we limit the duration of resection of the prostate they might have told you in your prostate class generally we limit to 45 minutes not more than that generally we will say do the surgery or finish of the surgery within one hour and we do it under spinal anesthesia because the patient can complain so if the patient is complaining anything that means immediately there are lot of venous channels have opened there is lot of systemic absorption is there so first thing is stop surgery because if you don't stop what will happen you know the fluid will shift into your uh, brain also and it will cause you know seizures etc etc okay respiratory arrest cardiac arrest that you can expect right the first thing what you have to do is stop surgery second thing give 100 percent oxygen you can just believe it most of the anesthesia related complication you can handle it like this only stop surgery give 100 percent oxygen if the patient airway breathing circulation is not appropriate take care of abc's airway breathing circulation you have to take care of abc suppose if the patient is you know saturation is not maintaining or his lungs are filled flooded up with it put an endotracheal tube inside if the patient is throwing seizure so low sodium values have developed acutely that too acutely so if the patient is having seizure again the same principle give some benzodiazepine give some benzodiazepine so that the seizures will be controlled now the fourth step what i will do is generally this is only for theoretical purpose send for the lab send for the lab investigations that to which investigation i am very much interested as i said you there should be serum electrolytes in serum electrolytes very important is sodium values but i will not wait till the sodium values come into the picture why because i know the pathophysiology so what i will do is immediately what should i do sir sodium is low sodium is low this is fourth one is only for theoretical purpose only sodium is low what should be i doing it immediately shall i infuse the sodium no here the problem is not due to sodium low but it is due to water overload if it is due to water overload what should i do i should flush off the water flush off the excess of fluid excess of fluid this is very very important how do i flush off the excess of fluid by administering lasix or furosemide this is powerful loop diuretic you might have learnt in your physio uh, pharmacology this is a powerful loop diuretic uh, that should be given how much is the dose generally i prefer a dose up to 1 mg per kg i can go for loop diuretic uh, and so that you know this has got you know very good positive water clearance also so whatever the fluid that is excessively accumulated in your lungs in your body it will be removed out very quickly and in meanwhile also what i will do is as i am giving this furosemide there are chances of hypotension is there and i want to see whether the patient is having hypotension is developed or not so i will go for invasive blood pressure and i also want to see the volume overload status i will also go for central venous pressure so again then this is only for theoretical purpose so what is the important step here is don't give sodium don't give sodium don't give sodium if the sodium is problem if you are giving sodium that means you are doing a big mistake to the patient okay so here the problem is fluid overload and flush out the fluid with the help of furosemide suppose if the sodium levels are very very low less than 120 milli equivalents if the symptoms are very severe if the symptoms are very severe then only i will administer sodium then only i will administer sodium how much i have to how i will administer i generally administer three percent normal saline 
I generally administer 3%. No. Can I rapidly correct this sodium correction? No. As you all know, if you rapidly correct the sodium, the patient will go into rapidly correcting, just to finish off the topic, rapidly correcting the sodium will cause central pontine myelinosis. Central pontine demyelination. This you all know, I think. So, how much sodium you are correcting? My target is not more than 0.5 to 1 milli equivalents per hour. Very slow correction is needed. So, very, very important, not more than 0.5 to 1 milli equivalent per hour. That means if you put it for one day, it will be around, you know, 12, 10 to 12 milli equivalents. Okay, so my whole target is identify the problem, what they have stated in this question. The problem they have stated is transurethral resection of the prostate and in transurethral resection of the prostate what is happening here we are producing TARP syndrome we call it as TARP syndrome and in TARP syndrome we are having hyponatremia and we are correcting hyponatremia. This is how I am approaching a patient of hyponatremia. This is very important complication generally as I said you this is done generally under spinal anesthesia. Right. So, uh, can you understand how I am approaching this subject? This is how the questions should be approached because, you know, in a routine video lecture might be, I might not have covered this that much, how I am managing this case. But this is a very common scenario which I encounter in my urology OT regularly if I go it. And very common area because, you know, this is not one thing which is specifically related to anesthesia. They might be asking you under medicine, they might be asking you under surgery, they might be asking you under anesthesia also. See, this is how you have to look at the case. Let us see the next question, what we are looking at. A six-year-old child, again, six-year-old child with a history of recent URTI, very, very important, with a history of recent URTI was posted for emergency surgery, right? Emergency surgery. At the end of surgery, the patient has shifted to post-operative ward or after the general anesthesia is done, the patient developed respiratory distress. Okay, the patient developed respiratory distress with a fall in saturation. What are the various possibilities? How to manage these complications? Again, this is very, very important for you for your entrance examination. So, this is very important. What they are, what they are asking is a six-year-old child with post-op fall in saturation. Okay. Very important. Am I just writing the keywords? Now, what I will do for you is in order to summarize the post-operative complications because this I have not specifically mentioned or I have not summarized in the routine video section. I am just putting it for you so that you will understand. So, what are the common post-operative problems you can encounter? Common post-operative problems you can see in the patient receiving general anesthesia in general anesthesia this is very very important common post-operative problem not exclusive for six year child i will discuss about six year child at a later time the first common post post-operative problem is hypoxia because you know most of the complications in anesthesia they are related to post-operative or intraoperative period so let us put it and summarize it in one table so that you will understand it the first one is hypoxia the second one is hypercarbia. These are our two good friends, right? The third one is hypoxia, hypercarbia. The third one is hypotension. This is also our good friend. Hypoxia, hypercarbia, um, hypotension. The fourth one is due, there can be delay in recovery. Delay in recovery from general anesthesia. Till now, they have not asked a question. I have not seen any question asking something which is related to delay in recovery. The fifth one is again oliguria or decreased urine output. Urine output. The sixth one, again, very commonly seen, chances they might ask you is airway obstruction. Airway obstruction. Right. So, what is the cause for hypoxia? Again, I am re-emphasizing the word. This is not for this question. I am just generally putting all the complications together in one scenario. 
ओके पोस्ट ऑपरेटिव कॉमन वॉट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज फॉर हाइपोक्सिया द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज फॉर हाइपोक्सिया इज ड्यू टू ड्रग्स वॉट आई एम यूजिंग अंडर जनरल अनस्थीशिया आई एम यूजिंग लॉट ऑफ रेस्पिरेटरी डिप्रेशन ड्रग्स और इनएडिकुएट रिवर्सल इनएडिकुएट रिवर्सल इनएडिकुएट रिवर्सल ऑफ द इफेक्ट ऑफ द मजल रिलैक्सेंट और द पेशेंट कैन हैव द पेशेंट कैन हैव एटीलेक्टासिस आफ्टर जनरल अनस्थीशिया एटीलेक्टासिस जनरली दिस इज नॉट सीन immediately after normal surgery you know atelectasis leading to fall in saturation is generally seen in children or in any you know upper abdominal surgery or thoracic surgery leading to atelectasis generally in under adults what will happen you know the atelectasis develops slowly after general anesthesia upper abdominal surgery or thoracic cavity thoracic surgery so i can suspect atelectasis the next one very common is diffusion hypoxia many times this has been asked in your entrance examination this is seen because i am using nitrous oxide already i have discussed nitrous oxide has got rapid diffusion capacity so it moves from pulmonary circulation into systemic circulation very quickly leading to diffusion hypoxia right there can be chances of bronchospasm there can be chances of bronchospasm there can be chances of laryngospasm there can be chances of laryngospasm there can be chances of pulmonary edema there can be chances of pulmonary edema there can be chances of pneumothorax pneumothorax you know sometimes sometimes these are very rare complications depending on the type of surgery you have to keep this one and you have to differentiate all these things diffusion hypoxia atelectasis or you know bronchospasm drugs inadequate reversal pulmonary edema etc what are the common causes of hypercarbia again the same cause drugs and inadequate reversal this is very very important drugs and inadequate reversal the second one is pain suppose if it is upper abdominal surgery because of pain the patient cannot take breath properly cannot take breathing properly and it will cause splinting effect or due to abdominal distension abdominal distension so this will cause hypercarbia so there will be difficulty in breathing movements leading to hypercarbia then what is the common cause for hypotension the hypotension is due to hypovolemia i have not supplied hypovolemia sorry for the spelling just write it down hypovolemia why hypovolemia because maybe during the surgery there might be excessive bleeding or you know i might have not have supplemented adequate amount of iv fluids during the surgery this can lead to hypovolemia or there is unexpected blood loss surgeon thought that it was a very good surgery and he closed off but there was an unexpected blood loss leading to hypovolemia or decreased venous return decreased venous return because there is vasodilatation there is vasodilatation why there is vasodilatation because maybe due to uh, my drugs my anesthesia drugs which i am using it so this can cause hypotension so very common hypovolemia mostly post operatively hypovolemia means first thing i will ask my surgeon to look whether it is bleeding or not generally iv fluids are one of the culprits second thing is more amount of fluid loss suppose if it is an intestinal surgery major surgery so there can be third space loss etc so hypovolemia is major cause leading to decreased venous return or you know uh, decreased cardiac output leading to it or sometimes my drugs anesthesia drugs can also cause hypotension right then what are the causes for delay in recovery so what are the causes for delay in recovery so residual anesthesia effect again as i said you may no one will ask you this kind of question but just to finish off residual anesthetic effects or decreased uh, brain perfusion decreased cerebral perfusion cerebral perfusion i'll write it as cpp cerebral perfusion pressure okay rather than brain perfusion this is a better term so decreased cerebral perfusion or sometimes the patient has developed stroke there's a reason why he is not coming out of anesthesia or very commonly seen in diabetics is hypoglycemia is hypoglycemia this is very very important okay then comes what is the causes for 
oliguria decrease in urine output again this was not asked many times but again the same concept of your medicine what they have told you so whenever you see a case of oliguria think of pre renal causes renal causes post renal causes again i will not go into the details i i know you are very thorough at your medicine knowledge pre renal means decreased amount of iv fluids trauma etc renal causes is some injury due to contrast etc or post renal you might have not your catheter is not in position or something might have happened some obstruction is there so that's the reason why post renal causes so look at all these things whenever there is an case of oliguria or sometimes there can be airway obstruction what are the reasons for airway obstruction the most common reason very favorite question last year also this was asked in neat pg 23 is the tongue falling back tongue falling back why tongue is falling back because maybe you know the upper airway muscles i told in the class the upper airway muscles are sensitive to the effect of muscle relaxant so the patient might recover from the effect of anesthesia all the muscles might have recovered but the upper airway muscles are sensitive so they might cause tongue falling back this tongue falling back is leading to airway obstruction or there can be some secretions there can be some vomitus secretions vomiting blood aspiration what not post operative is a very very important area where you can anticipate these problems you know they can construct any scenario on this or very commonly seen complication for airway obstruction you can answer me this question what is the most common cause of airway obstruction in a patient undergoing thyroid surgery yes you are right so this can lead to bleeding at the thyroid surgery site surgical site leading to external compression external compression so i am just summarizing the post operative complications my whole goal is to put it in one paper so that you can understand so when they are like if they want to ask you a question on pulmonary edema they will give you that there is some crepitus that is heard in the post operative so they will give you that they have given so much amount of fluid of the patient or the patient cardiac status is not functioning so you have overloaded the patient patient heart is not under functional he will end up into pulmonary edema right if there is a pneumothorax ideally you know generally it will not happen but decrease in the air entry the hypotension will be there the patient will have complain of difficulty in breathing decreased air entry will be there then you can suspect a pneumothorax right tympanic note on percussion you can suspect pneumothorax so basing on this they can ask you any sort of complications basing on it they can put you on any scenario for it so let us see what they have asked in our question so what they have asked in our question is a 6 year old child with a history of recent urti posted for surgery developed respiratory distress so here what could be the reason so my whole target as i said you to tell you what is the reason here so here respiratory distress in a child in emergency surgery children emergency surgery after general anesthesia that but here the key word is urti recent history of urinary upper respiratory tract infection not urinary tract infection recent history of upper respiratory tract infection so if a patient is having recent history how many days you have to stop because in the ini set examination 2020 or 99 i don't remember exact year but they ask her which of the following patients develop post operative pulmonary dysfunction that's the reason why i kept this question okay so in an ideal elective case scenario if a patient has got upper respiratory tract infection especially in child you have to wait for 6 weeks ideally 6 to 8 weeks you have to stop your elective surgery because there can be chances of bronchospasm and laryngospasm so it's a emergency surgery what are all the things i can expect in this patient very common is bronchospasm as it is an emergency surgery bronchospasm with a recent history of urti my first thinking will go into bronchospasm the second thinking i will go is laryngospasm the second thinking i can suspect is laryngospasm the third thinking what i can suggest i can think of it is the patient is having residual effect of any other drugs residual effects of the drugs leading to you know hypoxia hypercarbia etc right the fourth thing is mechanical airway obstruction mechanical airway 
obstruction in the form of you know external compression secretions vomiting blood etc right or the patient tongue is large it is falling back because of the residual effects of the drug so here i need to chart it down out of all these four what can be the probable thing so it can be most probably bronchospasm or laryngospasm the rest of the things you can easily understand why they are not uh, pointing towards this disease how to differentiate between a bronchospasm and laryngospasm this is very very important bronchospasm you all know that is classically presented as v's typically in a children after general anesthesia because of your putting of your endotracheal tube it can provoke a bronchospasm episode with a history of recent urti it can provoke v's or a musical note that can be heard on the chest wall of the patient and as i said you v's by auscultation only you can identify v's you all know it clinically you are very sound people right so you keep your stethoscope on the chest wall you can hear a clinical musical note can be here so that's classical of bronchospasm that is the most common cause for respiratory distress in a child with a history of recent upper respiratory tract infection so how to treat this wheez very simple nebulization nebulization with bronchodilators or beta 2 agonists remember very important clinical based scenario is whenever there is a wheeze i am happy sir why are you happy with wheeze not that i am happy but i am more worried more worried if it is a silent chest that's what my heart will skip a beat if it is a silent chest that means there is no air entry if there is bronchospasm that means definitely some amount of movement of air is coming in and out so I, am, I can take care of it but if it is a silent chest that means you need to intubate the patient or you have to rule out other causes of pneumothorax or severe bronchospasm right so that's where very important point you keep a stethoscope and see whether there is air entry or not if there is air entry saturation is 88 i am not worried but if it is a silent chest then i am worried okay so very important silent chest is the keyword if in examination they say ch silent chest you have to immediately supply some amount of oxygen that means there is no air moving in and out okay fine then comes laryngospasm how do you identify laryngospasm again i told you many times in the classroom laryngospasm is the stridurous sound stridurous sound you can see at the end of extubation generally it is seen when a patient is not in adequate planes of anesthesia not in adequate planes of anesthesia not inadequate that means either intubation or extubation most commonly seen during extubation so the patient typically presents with this <laughs> this is the sound that he will present and there is a fall in saturation what is the first step you do in the management of it so the first you know sometimes they will not give you this stridurous sound they can say you know uh, paradoxical movement of chest wall paradoxical movement or rocking movement of the chest wall rocking movement of chest wall with no air entry with no air entry again i said you if there is no air entry the chest wall is moving in an a paradoxical movement or rocking movement then i am worried sometimes you know in a very severe case stridorous movement they might give you this word or they might use some other words also so what is the treatment you know provide 100 percent oxygen to the patient with a larsen maneuver i said you larsen maneuver means bilateral firm pressure on this mastoid process so that whatever the spasm that occurs in your laryngeal muscles will be broken the patient starts inhaling the patient starts taking deep breaths okay so this is first step what you have to do most of the times this will relieve sometimes in some patients this will not be relieved then immediately what you have to do is give injection propofol very very important mcq propofol propofol is the drug of choice in breaking the laryngeal spasm this will keep make the patient because the whole point is the laryngeal muscles are in stridorous condition because the patient is not in adequate planes of anesthesia so by giving propofol you are pushing the patients into deeper planes of anesthesia 
so that whatever the spasm is there why this spasm is occurring you know if there is some blood vomit or secretions because especially the two after emergency surgery at the time of extubation there will be slight trickling of this blood vomitus etc onto your vocal cords and you, there is a strong protective reflex that is there in your upper respiratory muscles so whenever there is some foreign body is entering into it it will go into spasm so this spasm to prevent aspiration it will go into spasm so this spasm is so severe that it might prevent the entry of air into your respiratory lung into your lungs leading to hypoxia respiratory distress fall in saturation so by giving propofol immediately there can be relaxation of this muscles and there can be nice breathing of the patient still the spasm is very very severe what to do then comes injection succinylcholine succinylcholine we give only 10 to 25 mg of succinylcholine small dose of succinylcholine because all your skeletal muscles laryngeal muscles these upper respiratory muscles they are in spasm condition so severe spasm that we are not able to ventilate the patient the patient saturation is falling there will be bradycardia so what will happen is injection gives succinylcholine 10 to 25 mg immediately because it's a quick short acting drug immediately the muscles relax and but what you need to do is as the muscles are relaxed you might need to intubate the patient a small dose of succinylcholine will help in relieving the spasm you might need to intubate the patient very favorite question this was asked in your entrance examination if you give succinylcholine how is succinylcholine metabolized in your body already i told you succinylcholine is metabolized by pseudocholinesterase but before giving succinylcholine you have reversed the patient with neostigmine so what will happen is this neostigmine is a molecule which will inhibit the activity of pseudocholinesterase so even though you are giving low dose of succinylcholine there can be prolonged action there can be prolonged action will of succinylcholine you can expect so that is the reason why i need to intubate the patient this is how i manage a post operative respiratory distress so first thing what i will do is i will try to identify what is the problem it can be due to hypoxia hypercarbia it can be due to laryngospasm bronchospasm pneumothorax typically after an emergency surgery and a general anesthesia with a history of recent urti my questions or my mind will run on this point is i have to rule out bronchospasm laryngospasm laryngospasm because this is one area where most of the students they get confused so sometimes they might ask you this kind of questions also hope this question is clear for you you got some insights of it so let us see the another question a 36 year old female patient is being operated for posterior fossa tumor again i added some words eh, which are exclusively for this okay so posterior fossa tumor in sitting position in sitting position under general anesthesia during the surgery the following etco2 curve is seen on the monitor on the monitor discuss the various possibilities again why i put this question the same reason is you know this was the question very frequently that have been asked that is about the capnographic monitors capnography okay by looking at that uh, waveform what is the thing that is striking so the waveform is typically this is a normal waveform and the second waveform or in the examination or in the question they said it is suddenly becoming zero suddenly becoming zero what could be the possibilities of it you all know i don't want to reinforce it uh, but again for the sake of question repetition i say you know the most common cause is endotracheal dislodgement endotracheal tube et tube disconnection or accidental extubation accidental extubation some disconnection happened at the circuit level or accidentally tube is pulled out this is one of the reason why your etco2 curve is dropping down to zero very quickly suddenly it is dropping down can it be this answer 
maybe it can be but very important point you have to understand is here they are specifically asking some scenario where they are saying this is some posterior fossa tumor in the sitting surge sitting position so this is typically pointing towards venous air embolism venous air embolism if there is a disconnection i am not worried because i look at the monitor i look at the patient i see okay there is some disconnection is happening and i can handle that situation but here see here the etco2 curve is dropping down to zero etco2 curve is dropping down to zero and here they specifically mentioned posterior fossa tumor and sitting position surgery under general anesthesia so there can be chances that the patient is going into venous air embolism right now before discussing anything about this first let us understand what are the various other uses of capnography so quickly i will tell you the first two already i have written sudden disconnections or accidental extubations venous air embolism surest sign of intubation surest sign of intubation right the third one which we have discussed is very important mcq this has been added in the recent cpr guidelines also monitoring the performance of monitoring the performance of cpr monitoring the performance of cpr the next one is to diagnose malignant hyperthermia very important question diagnose malignant hyperthermia to identify some of the problems during the surgery like recovery from anesthesia recovery from muscle relaxant effect especially muscle relaxant effect you can see there is a curer notch curer notch will be there already we have discussed i am not drawing it again because i don't want to waste your time right recovery from the effect of muscle relaxant or identify bronchospasm identify bronchospasm right identify bronchospasm or if there is some leakage in the sampling line or if there is any rebreathing of the circuit in all these conditions what can be this it can be endotracheal disconnection or venous air embolism now venous air embolism why it is a venous air embolism again i told you the risk factor is the sitting position sitting position any surgery you might have heard it uh, any surgery above the level of heart what will happen is if you are operating on it you know we take heart as reference point zero below the heart we uh, the pressures are positive and above the heart the pressures are negative so when a surgeon is cutting open the skin if the venous plexus are open especially when they are doing the surgeries on the brain posterior fossa tumors especially in sitting position why they are putting the patient in sitting position you know that's for surgeons convenience nowadays you are not putting it but generally you know if there is something that they are doing that's for during the surgery they have to visualize the fields so they are making the patient to sit but whenever they are cutting the skin over there there can be chances of dural venous plexus sinuses opening and as the pressure is negative there can be sucking of air sucking of air into the venous sinuses leading to venous air embolism and that to sometimes you know very commonly seen in neurosurgeries very commonly seen in neurosurgeries or head and neck surgeries like thyroid surgeries thyroid surgeries also you know sometimes the patient will be kept in a slight in a head up position again the thyroid veins if they are open less chances but more commonly seen with neurosurgical positions right now what will you do venous air embolism you know till now they have not identified how much amount of uh, air that to be injected is lethal but in lower group of animals they identify somewhere between 0.5 ml per kg of 0.5 ml per kg of uh, uh, even 0.2 also they have reported some studies but 0.5 ml kg of air if it is accidentally entered into your venous system this is causing lock it is entering directly into your heart and causing a lock leading to hypoperfusion right so this is very important and not only the amount of air that is entering they identified the speed two important factors if a small amount of air enters at a very slow speed nothing will happen it will be absorbed but if it's if a good amount of air is entering at a very fast speed this can kill the patient very immediately okay so one two points in venous air embolism you have to remember is the volume of air injecting speed of injection these two are very important speed of injection these two are very important for your 
examination point of view now coming to the management section of this this is my important point management how do you management means don't go into the treatment part how do you identify it two points how do you identify it how do you treat it management means that's what we are traditionally taught right first identify the condition second one is say uh, how do you treat it so first one is how do you identify it as i said you during neurosurgical procedure i have got various monitors on my patient uh, which will help me to identify the venous air embolism very very important mcq most favorite for most of the anesthesia professor that says uh, the very sensitive indicator for detecting venous air embolism is trans eso esophageal esophageal echocardiography trans esophageal echocardiography or doppler or doppler they are very very sensitive very very sensitive or we have discussed it pulmonary artery catheter PA catheter because you know as the air is entering into your right heart of the pressure so what will happen is there will be blocking in the pulmonary there will be blockade at the pulmonary vascular resistance is increasing and the PA pressures will increase right or there will be sudden presence of end tidal end tidal nitrogen end tidal nitrogen because air air contains how much amount of nitrogen 78 percent or 21 percent is only oxygen rest of it is nitrogen majority of your air whatever that is and that it enters into it you are monitoring carbon dioxide that monitor will show that suddenly nitrogen is coming on the monitor that means end tidal nitrogen will be there and uh, or fall in saturation fall in etco2 this might occur very quickly then there is a fall in oxygen levels fall in saturation then there can be hypotension there can be hypotension fall in bradycardia initially there can be some tachycardia but very predominantly they will have hypotension then very important at last clinically if you put your stethoscope and see you can see a windmill murmur a windmill murmur so in the routine video section i told you about various kinds of monitor and the sequence i have told you just i have putting it here so that you will understand the management is identification by using my monitors what is the treatment it might be this is the first thing they might ask you because we are talking more about the complication one the first thing is stop surgery again very very favorite thing for anesthetist annoying thing for surgeon is stop surgery the moment we see something is going wrong we'll ask the surgeon to stop immediately put the position patient in put the patient in head down position head down position why head down position because you know air always floats up so the moment you are keeping it there and trying to close it so stop surgery close that area and put the patient in head down position so whatever the air that is going down it will be pushed up okay third one is 100% FiO2 to the patient. Provide 100% FiO2 to the patient. Next one, very important. Stop nitrous oxide. If you are using nitrous oxide, stop administering nitrous oxide. Why? Again, I told you in the class, nitrous oxide has got rapid diffusion capacity. So, if there is capacity. So, if there is even small amount of here that entered into your system this nitrous oxide what will it do you know it increases the size of the air bubble because it has got 33 times faster diffusion capacity than air oxygen so whatever the nitrous oxide that enters into your alveoli air bubbles it will increase the size as the volume is increasing then it will be very big problem okay so stop uh, stop the surgery put the patient in head down position then stop nitrous oxide generally what we do is we keep the patient in left lateral position and in a head down position so that whatever the air that comes on so what we will do is we'll put a insert a central line already you know neurosurgery cases means we will put a central line through the central line we will aspirate we will aspirate the air through the central line we will aspirate the air that will be the very important thing through multi-port channel we'll start aspirating the blood and air so that whatever the air that is causing the lock it will be pulled out okay if in meanwhile if the patient collapses what we do is we start cpr 
we start CPR. So very, very important MCQ. If you ask me, if someone wants to ask me, what I will do is I will say stop surgery, 100% FIO2, stop N2O. This is very, very important for your entrance examination. So first thing is, please identify what is venous air embolism. Venous air embolism is typically seen with neurosurgeries that too in sitting positions. So here the take home points they are coming towards uh, is venous air embolism. This is a very favorite question for the examiners. I just mentioned how do you identify it and how are we going to treat it? Okay. Shall we move to the next question? Right. So, what is the next question? A 30 year old female is posted for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Okay, very good. 30 year old female is posted for laparoscopic cholecystectomy under general anesthesia. She is a known case of hypertension. Taking tablet amlodipine calcium channel blocker 5 mg daily. Her preoperative vitals are normal before induction of anesthesia. During the surgery, the patient had tachycardia and hypertension. The patient had tachycardia and hypertension. What are the reasons for it and how do you manage these complications? This is very important. You know, again, intraoperative complications or, you know, intraoperative complications. Let us see what is the reason for uh, intraoperative intraoperative hypertension right so what is the key point here so the patient is having hypertension is a known case of hypertension she is taking regularly antihypertensive medications tablet amlodipine that means to which asa grading she belongs to she belongs to asa grade 2 so, he has clearly mentioned that the patient is having normal vitals before surgery and during the surgery, the patient developed intra intraoperative hypertension. What are the reasons for it? Very common reason. What is striking to your mind? Pre-existing hypertension. So, she is having pre-existing hypertension. That's the reason why her pressures are slightly on higher side might be that is not well controlled not related to this question but generally if she is a known hypertension her preoperative vitals are only 160 by 95 we have taken it for surgery then obviously you can expect some amount of hypertension during the surgery also right so pre-existing hypertension is very very important second one during the surgery or post-operative hypertension also very common presenting point is pain 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 during surgery, many students, they think, many surgeons also, they think that the patient is under general anesthesia. Patient can't feel the pain. No, it is not at all this thing. You have to provide balanced anesthesia. Balanced anesthesia. I told you this topic, anesthesia. Balanced anesthesia was introduced by John Lundy. Right? So, in balanced anesthesia, we have four A's. What are the four A's? Amnesia. Analgesia, adequate muscle relaxation, adequate muscle relaxation. The last one is abolition of reflexes, abolition of reflexes. So, if you don't provide, just providing muscle relaxants under general anesthesia makes the patient immobile. But she can recollect all the things. First point. Second one, she will have tachycardia and hypertension. That means the patient is not provide analgesic or the patient is not under adequate planes of anesthesia. Planes of anesthesia. Now, how to monitor or how should I know whether the patient is in adequate planes of anesthesia or not? Very important monitor I have is BIS, bispectral index. Again, this was asked in the previous year MCQs. What is BIS, bispectral index that is used to monitor the depth of anesthesia? If you are not depth of anesthesia if you are not providing adequate planes for her that means she is coming out of anesthesia then obviously the bis values will be higher 80 90 etc what should be the normal bis values the target bis values should be 40 to 60 under general anesthesia so that she cannot recollect her vitals are stable rock stable and you are providing good amount of analgesic that means the patient will not have any hypertensive during the surgery or post-operatively so very important cause is 
పెయిన్ నెక్స్ట్ వన్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ ఓవర్లోడ్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ ఓవర్లోడ్ ఆబ్వియస్లీ యూ క్యాన్ రూల్ అవుట్ ఫ్లూయిడ్ ఓవర్లోడ్ దేర్ ద థర్డ్ ఫోర్త్ వన్ ఈజ్ వెరీ వెరీ ఇంపార్టెంట్ కార్బన్ డైఆక్సైడ్ ఇంక్రీజ్డ్ కార్బన్ డైఆక్సైడ్ హైపర్ కార్బియా సార్ వై దేర్ విల్ బీ హైపర్ కార్బియా దేర్ విల్ బీ హైపర్ కార్బియా మైట్ బీ బికాస్ ద వెంటిలేషన్ ఈజ్ నాట్ గుడ్ వెంటిలేషన్ ఈజ్ నాట్ ప్రాపర్ యువర్ సర్క్యూట్ యూ హ్యావ్ నాట్ చూజన్ ఇట్ ప్రాపర్లీ ఆర్ ద పేషెంట్ యూ హ్యావ్ నాట్ సెట్ ద రెస్పిరేటరీ రేట్ ప్రాపర్లీ సో కార్బన్ డైఆక్సైడ్ ఈజ్ అక్యుములేటింగ్ సో హర్ హౌ షుడ్ ఐ నో వెదర్ ద కార్బన్ డైఆక్సైడ్ ఈజ్ అక్యుములేటింగ్ ఆర్ నాట్ లుక్ ఎట్ యువర్ ఈటీసీఓ టూ ఈటీసీఓ టూ వాల్యూస్ విల్ బీ ఇంక్రీజింగ్ రైట్ ఈవెన్ ఇఫ్ యూ టేక్ అన్ ఏబీజీ ఇఫ్ యూ టేక్ అన్ ఏబీజీ ద పిఏసీఓ టూ వాల్యూస్ ఆర్ ఆల్సో ఇంక్రీజింగ్ so you can identify for generally we don't go for laparoscopic cholecystectomy you put a etco2 monitor that's a standard monitor you can see the etco2 here very specifically he said laparoscopic cholecystectomy in laparoscopy what is the commonly infiltrated gas carbon dioxide so this carbon dioxide is causing hypercarbia and we all know hypercarbia carbon dioxide is a powerful sympathetic stimulant sympathetic stimulant leading to increased blood pressure laparoscopic cholecystectomy the answer is there in the question only right laparoscopic cholecystectomy the patient is having raised bp known hypertension two risk factors are there then comes as the carbon dioxide is accumulating there can be acidosis initially acidosis will present with hypertension later it means in severe acidosis is there then she will go into hypotension bradycardiac arrest then there can be due to raised icp which is unusual in this case but again what is this reflex whenever there is a raised icp then there can be hypertension and also bradycardia can also can occur okay right then there can be due to full bladder this is again very commonly seen in my practice you know that's the reason why whenever a patient is under before coming to general anesthesia i'll ask them to void and come because if the bladder is full even though you provide adequate depth of anesthesia the patient can have increased blood pressure this is very very important you know they might ask you this kind of clinical scenarios they might put you 30 year old female posted for laparoscopic cholecystectomy her bis monitor is 72 which of the following can be the most possible cause for her rise in uh, rise in blood pressure during the surgery you can come down so that's the reason why i'm putting it on a very superficial note all covering all the complications what are the reasons for it so they can frame any questions basing on this okay so what will happen if you don't treat this hypertension properly or what is the second most common complication you can expect in this patient is which is not asked in the question is erythemias during surgery there can be chances of erythemias what is the cause for erythemias again very common if there is anything to be blamed that is due to hypoxia the second most favorite is hypercarbia this is again favorite 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 right so this is you need not tell also hypoxia hypercarbia first thing is you have to rule out this one the third one is sympathetic discharge here why there is sympathetic discharge because you know carbon dioxide as i said you just know i said you carbon dioxide is a powerful sympathetic stimulant so this can cause ventricular arrhythmias for this patient also so this you have to keep it in mind so this is a laparoscopic procedure there can be chances of sympathetic stimulation also or there can be some metabolic causes like as you know acidosis etc they can be aggravating this uh, arrhythmias are there or the patient is having pre-existing erythemias pre-existing erythemias sometimes you know you, in the pac you might have missed it or you might have noted it but still pre-existing erythemias very important is mi if something is going wrong the patient is heart is not perfused then immediately she might develop during surgery she might develop myocardial ischemia or infarction now very very important how do you identify myocardial ischemia or infarction during surgery patient is having heart attack how do you identify it if the patient is awake she will tell you retro sternal chest pain reading it etc etc but during surgery how will you identify whether the patient is having ischemia or not very important is you know this monitor very favorite monitor ecg which lead which rhythm strip you have to look at for mi lead v5 or v6 because this is the portion where you are keeping it on the left ventricle wall 
and that is the most common area because left ventricle size is more more chances that it may go into ischemia or infarction so generally lead v5 and v6 is very sensitive to detect arrhythmias and why these arrhythmias are occurring they, uh, because there can be chances of mi the second one is in ecg again one more important question if you want to detect arrhythmias if you want to detect arrhythmias lead to because it lies along the axis of the heart in the routine axis of the heart is your lead to so what i will do is during surgery if a patient is known case of hypertension very important point is please identify the mi the second one is already you have written the second one is identify whether the patient is in adequate planes of anesthesia the third one is pain just because patient is not moving again i am reemphasizing patient is not moving that she cannot perceive pain no you have to provide adequate analgesia then only the patient vitals will be stable okay so they can frame any question basing on this uh, they can be asking so what are the reasons for altered hemodynamics how to manage these complications i know i think most of the complications you know how to manage it so again i am not reemphasizing it okay so this is very important question they can high probability that they can ask you this kind of questions also right let us see the next question a 26 year old female is scheduled for a cosmetic hair transplant surgery so okay it's a cosmetic hair transplant surgery as an office based procedure again what do you mean by office based procedure that means the procedure is done at the consultation room it's not scheduled in the main ot right fine the following is the nerve blocks are performed the following are the nerve blocks that have been performed identify which nerves are blocked now this is very important question because of late i am seeing this kind of question in your examination in 2021 and 22 in ini set examination they have marked one or two nerves and asked what is the nerve blocked what is the nerve blocked they have asked this very simply right now if you want to answer this kind of question it's very easy it will become very easy if you know the surface anatomy if you know the surface anatomy if you know where there is a nerve then definitely as i said you in my routine video lectures if you go back and see what are the videos nerve blocks i have covered in the routine lectures is i have covered for the upper limb please go through those videos even if you can't go through the complete video just see where i am putting the needle because you know uh, they have been asking this kind of questions of later in the last two years if they are asking means there is a high probability that they can ask you so in upper limb i you all know the nerve supply is brachial plexus so this brachial plexus is supplied at uh, is blocked it can be blocked at your interscalene region it can be blocked at your supraclavicular region it can be blocked at the infraclavicular region please see here how i am putting so supraclav interscalene means between your scalene muscles supraclavicular means at your in at your supraclavicular fossa interscalene region then at the axillary region i also showed where i am putting the needles in the arm suppose if there is a needle that is pointing towards my medial epicondyle what is this nerve that i am going to block so this is your ulnar nerve right suppose if they are putting a needle medial to this brachial artery what is the needle the, what is the nerve that i am going to block that is median nerve right suppose if they are putting a needle in my anatomical snuff box what is the needle what is the nerve that i am going to block that's a radial nerve so you might be knowing it and i have covered it entirely in the block section at least look at the image based questions because they will not ask you how are you performing a block as i said you in that video also how are you performing is no one will ask you but if they point out here you should be know, able to tell what block they are going to see and i also covered the lower limb blocks in the form of uh, you know femoral nerve block sciatic nerve block popliteal nerve block and also ankle block so i am not repeating this one okay i also in the neck region i have covered the cervical plexus block cervical plexus block just see the anatomy cervical plexus is you know superficial cervical and deep cervical plexus it is on the lateral border of your sternocleidomastoid you can easily identify it and on the thoracic wall you can see the intercostal nerve block okay on the thoracic wall i have covered the intercostal nerve block right and on the abdomen i have covered the transverse abdominal spleen block or transverse abdominal spleen block 
we call it as tab block transfer subdominus plane block okay so these videos or these theoretical points i have covered in the section of peripheral no blocks or peripheral neuraxial blockade chapter so i am not going to repeat it again because i know if you have watched it please uh, remember it but i wanted to specifically tell the nerves which i have not particularly concentrated but you know they are being repeatedly asking so i wanted to specifically identify some areas of the nerves which you are very much interested in the recent pattern of examination so what are these nerves that are blocked so can you see there he has mentioned something occipital protuberance and this is a mastoid process so it between he has drawn an imaginary line so how to answer this question so he has mentioned it very clearly he has drawn an imaginary line can you see there so he is pointing out an imaginary line he has drawn and what he has done is he uh, okay i'll remove this so that you will not get confused okay can you see here i'll highlight this area so he has drawn an imaginary line and near the occipital protuberance there is one marking that is there so what could be this now and there is in between your uh, mastoid process and uh, occipital protuberance there is one more block he is giving so what is the nerve that they are blocking so the first one what they are blocking uh, is uh, is your greater occipital nerve greater occipital nerve the second one what they are blocking is lesser occipital nerve no don't expect the same image or something like that i know you are very much intelligent student so you will not expect but you know you should know the surface landmark then only you can identify what now it is blocking so as i said you i am not going to repeat what i have told you but this is one area which i have not shown you in the routine video because i thought it will be easy for you to identify you will not say what is this now you will not say inferior alveolar now or you will not say this is sciatic now okay so but what examiners are examiners also were they are very smart people so what they are putting is they are putting very close options that's the reason why i made this one okay so the first one is this one is greater occipital now this block is greater occipital block this is the lesser occipital now so for cosmetic hair transplant surgery they are doing it so i'll show you some other blocks also just understand the location of the identification of the needle that will be sufficient for your examination so see here this has been asked this is the supra orbital nerve block where it is there very close to it very close to it is your supra trochlear nerve block supra orbital and supra trochlear so how i block it so on your medial one third of your eyebrow you can can you feel your superior superior orbital foramina so can you feel a dip there so from there your supra orbital so these are the branches of your trigeminal now i am not going to go into the details right i guess you all know it so this is your superior orbital foramina and on this superior orbital foramina i am going to inject along the eyebrow line so on my eyebrow line if i am going to inject so i am going to block your supra orbital now and is supra trochlear now so on the infra orbital foramina can you see there so there are so many nerves that are coming out so infra orbital foramina it's, it's in the same straight line supra orbital foramina infra orbital foramina and you are mental now right so these are the various branches so on the face the three nerves which i am going to block so please understand if i am telling one now don't go into the details of it like what are the branches of your ophthalmic nerve there are ciliary branch naso ciliary branch frontal branch etc so go into the details so you should be knowing the theory part okay so they will not ask you but if you know where this supra orbital foramina is exiting so it is supra orbital nerve block this is your infra orbital nerve block this is your mental nerve block so this is very very important and in your recent ini set examination they have asked something anterior ethmoidal nerve block so this is they have asked this one anterior ethmoidal so they put a needle something like this needle here and they marked what is this now that is going to be blocked so it is easy provided you know the surface anatomy so i am not telling where it is coming out okay so coming to your i ear so ear you can see the ear anatomy again i have specifically mentioned so this is your greater auricular now so the greater auricular now is supplying from this region so this is your auricular branch of the vagus now this is your lesser occipital now this is your auricular temporal now so auricular temporal now what generally what we do is for ear we will give like you know these are all field blocks actually okay so this area is supplied by your auricular temporal auricular temporal now so the yellow one which is marked 
right so this area is supplied by your lesser occipital this one is your greater auricular now and last one is auricular branch of the vagus now okay so we will put it in front of one needle in front of your tragus another needle at the point at the in front of your mastoid process then we are going to block this now sir okay just have a look at these images because you know high probability that they might ask you this question and one more image which i wanted to show very specifically because this was again asked last year what is the now that they are going to branch below the inguinal uh, ligament something like that they have asked the question so which now so see here this is the femoral branch of genito femoral now can you see there it is slightly lateral and slightly close to your genitalia is your genital branch of your genital femoral now okay again there are very important nerve blocks that is ilio hypogastric and ilio inguinal now they are very close to your iliac crest iliac crest okay and uh, there are some thoraco abdominal nerves i am not talking about intercostal nerve block because already we have discussed about intercostal nerve block so very important if you are targeting for your central examinations in anesthesia of late i have been seeing this kind of questions please go through that location of the needle that will be sufficient okay so if they are putting near the popliteal fossa then you should be able to identify where that is coming out from okay if they are putting it near your posterior tibial artery i can't show you my leg right so if you are, they are putting near posterior tibial artery that means what is the nerve that is closely present right so you should be where is your sural now so you should be able to identify your surface anatomy so take home point from this anatomy question is identify surface anatomy surface anatomy that will be sufficient okay so if you want to answer this kind of questions please go through the surface anatomy because if i start telling surface anatomy and peripheral nerve blocks again it will be a six to eight hour session okay so i just wanted to concentrate on this area very important for your entrance examination let us see the next question right you are a doctor attending a 64 year old male patient outside the hospital with sudden cardiac arrest again this is one key area need pg ini set examination they are really concentrating on it one is basic life support and advanced cardiac life support very very important the most important intervention with witnessed cardiac arrest is is it early activation of is it early activation of emergency medical system or high quality cpr discuss the guidelines that to be followed now this is very very important the key words are the guidelines so what i will do in this session because you have listened to it i'll just quickly revise those areas so that you can understand it so what are the first thing so according to 2020 guidelines they have added a sixth chain of survival sixth link in the sixth link in the chain of survival sixth link in the chain of survival so what are the key steps here so see here out of hospital cardiac arrest ohca i mentioned it as ohca so i have provided the algorithm everything just superficially so first thing is activate ems first thing is activate ems he has mentioned it very clearly activate your emergency medical system then start high quality cpr high quality cpr then if you get a defibrillator immediately defibrillate the patient then wait for you know you continue cpr till you get an advanced resuscitation advanced resuscitation the last one is post cardiac arrest care post cardiac arrest care then look for recovery long term recovery short term recovery okay so this is six links okay one two three four five six in in hospital cardiac arrest also they have added sixth link what are this one first one is early identification this is very important early identification and or early identification or recognition and prevention so identify the high risk patients who are going to develop arrhythmias who are going to develop sudden cardiac arrest second step again activate ems activate ems then do high quality cpr i am just mentioning it as two because i am slightly lazy person right then go for third step that is defibrillation then go for post cardiac 
sorry then go for post cardiac resuscitation 235 that's the reason why i mentioned it here 1 2 3 4 5 6 this is the sixth one recovery right so this is the chain of survival this is updated according to aha guidelines that is american heart association guidelines we have updated our this thing right the next one is uh, how do you do the bls very quickly i will tell you okay uh, basic life support if you are outside hospital first thing what you have to do i already told you you all know it first thing is verify scene safety verify scene safety right second thing is check for responsiveness shout on the patient check responsiveness whether you are okay not okay call for help activate emergency activate ems emergency medical system get an aed divide if you are all alone get an aed divide start doing the chest compressions how many compressions you have to do already i told you again i am not repeating if you don't remember please go through that how many times you have to do how many cycles you have to do that's very very important so once you get the ems this was asked in neat pg 2023 need pg 2023 they have asked this question so suddenly a patient has collapsed or a pa- they have given an image of patient in left lateral position what could be the possible you know when you are you keeping a patient in left lateral position so once you get a patient you have a patient suddenly collapsed there can be three possibilities i am not going into the details superficially i am telling you the first one is normal breathing and respiration normal breathing normal respiration so if the patient is normally breathing normally respi- respiring then what will you do if the patient is having no breathing no breathing but pulse present normal breathing normal respiration pulse present no breathing but pulse present no breathing or yes breathing or agonal breath agonal breaths then pulse absent what will you do so the moment i say pulse absent jump to cpr start doing compressions okay at the lower one third of the sternum around 100 to 120 per minute 30 is to 2 cycle all these things we have discussed suppose if the patient is not breathing then immediately provide rescue ventilation rescue ventilation with the help of bag mask or something like that if the patient is normally breathing or slightly obstructed what we do is we put the patient in recovery position recovery position so you all know this i am not going to emphasize on the guidelines because already we have discussed it enough of it in the theory part okay then then once you get that uh, what we call it as once you get this uh, uh, defibrillator and all these things uh, let us see how the uh, once you started your cpr how are we doing it so once we are doing the cpr there can be two possible rhythms one is shockable rhythm another one is non shockable rhythm just superficially i am telling you okay so if it is non shockable rhythm what is the example of non shockable rhythm it is pea pulseless electrical activity or asystole what are shockable rhythms it is ventricular fibrillation or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia monomorphic generally it can be managed with medicines but very important monomorphic can land up into polymorphic also suppose if it is non shockable rhythm you have to continue cpr check the pulse every second minute check the pulse every second minute in meanwhile get an intravenous access or intra what we call it as intra osseous access intravenous or intra osseous access give epinephrine how many times you will repeat when will you repeat so every 3 to 5 minutes you will start repeating it then consider then continue cpr continue cpr and monitor every 2 minutes leave okay very very important high quality cpr push hard and fast do not interrupt everything we have discussed okay for every 2 minutes you have to check suppose if it is vf and vt first thing what you have to do first thing if it is rhythm is shockable then give shock immediately give the shock till the time you get the defibrillator continue cpr if you get the defibrillator machine attached all the pads then give the shock then what you have to do is continue cpr immediately after delivering of the shock you continue cpr up to 2 minutes then check for pulse 
check for pulse. You know, once you give the shop, don't check for the pulse because, you know, if the patient is having pulse and you do CPR, nothing will happen. Hardly one or two ribs break. But if the patient is not having pulse, you wait for again checking of the pulse, then there is a high possibility that whatever you have done, you are perfusing the brain that will go down. So immediately after delivering the shock, continue CPR for two minutes. So again, check for the pulse. If the pulse is not there, again, give the shock. Second time shock also you have given. So after second time shock, you give third time shock. Okay. So after second shock, what you will do is you will start giving epinephrine, epinephrine or adrenaline. Consider, uh, consider for advanced airway, etc, etc. So you continue third shock, then we go for recovery. So once all this is done, whether the patient is recovered or not, I also told you when to stop a CPR. Okay, when to stop CPR or I also emphasized post resuscitation care. Post resuscitation care here so very very important so when we are doing the post resuscitation care guidelines have very clearly mentioned go for targeted temperature control targeted slight amount of hypothermia this will be beneficial for the recovery so this is one question which is very important for your entrance examination so i just superficially covered it if you have not read about this Please look at the video. Very, very important. Right. Let us see the next question. A 62 year old male patient was admitted in ICU uh, in ICU for MI. Okay. The following are the ABG values of the patient. pH is equal to 7.47. PaO2 57. PaCO2 33. Bicarbonate 25. Okay. What to do? What is the next best step in the management? So, what are the oxygen therapy? Uh, what we have discussed routinely, oxygen therapy. What we have discussed. So, I said the oxygen therapy can be of two types, actually three types. But for simplification, we put it as uh, two types. One is low flow, variable performance. high flow fixed performance performance devices so low flow variable performance devices this includes nasal cannula simple face mask simple face mask face mask with a reservoir bag or a non rebreathing mask I have shown you the images. I have made a nice clinical scenario in that video and we discussed a lot about this uh, images because in 2020, 2021, 2022, they asked about the flow rates. They identified about the, uh, they, they asked about the flow rates. They showed the image of it. What is the flow rate they have asked? So please don't neglect this question. This is very important question also. Okay. And in high flow fixed performance devices, we have Venturi devices. Sir, you said there are three. What is the third one? The other one in oxygen therapy is hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which we generally don't use it clinically. I have never used it actually. So you, there are specific indications when we are using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. You all know that it is during carbon monoxide poisoning or due to deep sea diving patients, etc, etc. So please go through that section. Very important. Low flow variable devices and a fixed performance devices. Now, how to approach a patient with hypoxia? Clinically, I gave you one flow chart. If you remember it, I just made a superficial note of it so that you can easily identify. The moment you see a patient with uh, hypoxia, here definitely there is hypoxia because you know, you can see the patient pH is slightly elevated. 7.35 to 7.45. You are all masters of ABG. I know this right so it is slightly elevated okay what is the normal value of pao2 the normal value of pao2 is between 80 to 100 for a patient who is breathing normal room air it should be between 80 to 100 but here the patient is having decreased pao2 okay then coming to pacvo2 again pacvo2 is between 35 to 45 slightly decreased not that much decreased but it is slightly decreased okay uh, then bicarbonate is between 22 to 26 fine 25 is a normal value okay that means patient is slightly hyperventilating he is in icu and uh, what is the next best step if you ask me what is the next best step what i will do is generally before ordering abg what i will do is i will 
put a SPO2 probe and see the ABG. This is my clinical approach. Okay. So, first thing is put a SPO2 probe to know the oxygenation of the patient. I am not here to discuss about the ABG, what are the causes of metabolic acidosis, etc. Please go through that. That is a separate section. Okay. So, I am interested in oxygen therapy for the patient. So, put a SPO2 probe and see how much is the saturation value. Suppose if the saturation is between 92. Okay, it's showing 92 percentage. Now you got an ABG values also. Now how will you approach this patient? So what I did is I put it in a theoretical form so that you will understand it. So see here how to initiate oxygen therapy. First thing is look at for respiratory compromise. Is there any respiratory compromise? If there is respiratory compromise, yes. The answer is very clear. If there is a respiratory compromise, what I have to do? I have to jump and intubate. That is what I am meant for in an ICU. Airway, taking care of an airway. So, respiratory compromise is there. Sir, how to identify respiratory compromise? That the patient will be unconscious. Patient is unconscious, drowsy, not arousable. Not arousable. Hemodynamics not maintained properly hemodynamics not maintained properly so all these they do add up for respiratory compromise so whenever these are conditions are present then i jump and put an endotracheal tube inside connect him to a ventilator my job is done it's very simple right now here comes the next point so there is no respiratory compromise the patient is not having any res no respiratory compromise. So, what is the second step I have to do? Then get a history. The patient is stable. Then get a history. Why the whether the patient is having any type 2 respiratory. Sorry. When a, whether a patient is having type 2 respiratory failure or not. Type 2 respiratory failure or not. So, that means if the, a patient is having any history of COPD, etc., Interstitial lung disease, not interstitial air lung disease exactly. But if whether a patient is having any COPD or not, I, I have to identify. Suppose if there is a history of type 2 respiratory failure, then what should I do? What is my target SpO2? Never aim for 100% in type 2 respiratory failure. So what is my target? I am happy with 88 to 92 percentage of SpO2 value. Here what is the SpO2 value in the question? It was around 92 percentage. So next question what I have to ask to my patient is whether he is having history of COPD or not. If he is having history of COPD, SpO2 between 88 to 92 percentage is a very good SpO2 value for him. Okay, fine. So, how to get a 88 to 90? Sir, you have mentioned it very clearly. 92 percentage, you are happy. But here, uh, the SPO2, how do you titrate it? By using fixed performance devices. Fixed performance devices like Venturi mask. Venturi mask. Because, you know, I can control the flow rates. I can control how much amount of FiO2 that is entering. So, I can titrate the FiO2 values and I can fix the SpO2 values. If it is 88 to 92 percentage, it's good. Suppose even if I am using the Venturi mask, if the patient is not able to maintain it, get a ABG done. Very important. Again, get an ABG done. If the patient ABG is normal, continue with this Venturi mask. Okay, if the ABG is abnormal, then consider for non-invasive ventilation or an invasive ventilation. Non-invasive ventilation means what? Non-invasive ventilation means in the form of CPAP or BiPAP. Okay, so this is how I approach a patient. First one is put an SpO2, then like look for uh, there is respiratory compromise is there or not. Second one is for res type 2 respiratory failure. Yes, now I look at if there is no history of type 2 respiratory failure. Now there can be two situations. Okay, there can be saturation between 88 to 94. Here my target, if he is not a type 2 respiratory failure, here my target is somewhere between 98 to 100. 97, 98, 99, I am happy with this. Okay, so if the saturation is between 88 to 94 or if the saturation is less than 85 percentage, there can be two scenarios. Right. So, if the saturation is between 88 to 94 percentage, what I will do is I will put him on low flow devices like, like a nasal cannula, simple oxygen mask, 
सिंपल ऑक्सीजन फेस मास्क सिंपल ऑक्सीजन फेस मास्क एंड आई विल मेंटेन द सैचुरेशन बिटवीन 98 इन मीन वाइल इन मीन वाइल अगेन if the condition of the patient is deteriorating not improving i'll get an abg to decide whether to continue or not continue okay saturation is not maintaining 85 percentage it is less than 85 percentage what will i do i will order for an abg i will order for the abg suppose if in the abg the values are normal if the values are normal i will go for non rebreathing mask that is oxygen mask with a reservoir bag i showed you that image i think most of you can identify that one so an oxygen mask with a rebreathing uh, sorry non rebreathing bag mask or bag mask ventilation no nrbm so this will provide maximum oxygen to the patient maximum increase in or maximum oxygen to the patient or or maximum fio2 to this patient okay if the abg values are abnormal abnormal then i will consider non invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation this is my approach to a patient so if you look at very closely so this this is the same thing i am not telling you anything new this is there in that video section only for those who have missed out they might get this one so oxygen therapy is very very important because that too after covid the people have started asking this question so first one is look at the spo2 value if the patient is respiratory compromise is there severe respiratory compromise go and intubate if it is less then look for type 2 respiratory failure what is the target in type 2 respiratory failure 88 to 92 if it is normal patient then look at the saturation somewhere between 85 to less more than 85 but less than 95 so in between 85 to 95 you can manage simple devices less than 85 abg is normal go for nrbm if it is severe abg is deteriorating then go for invasive ventilation or non invasive ventilation so this is how uh, very superficially i discussed the i have discussed about the various uh, how to manage the oxygen therapy here we are not interested in what is the diagnosis what is the abg picture or what is the cause of it here i am only interested in oxygen therapy and after covid as i said you many questions are asking one more important thing which i wanted to add it here is uh, please identify the oxygen concentrator also oxygen concentrator was very popular in covid period many people were buying this oxygen concentrator maybe they can ask you in any of the image based question till now they have not asked that's for sure okay so look at how the oxygen concentrator sir where is this oxygen concentrator image in the routine videos of anesthesia in marrow i have covered it please go through that video how it is working just a single line statement okay so you can see the image of oxygen concentrator it works on pressure swing absorption technology so what it is doing is it takes out the nitrogen from your atmospheric air and gives only 96 percentage of pure oxygen okay so this oxygen therapy is very important for your entrance examination that too post covid right fine shall we move to the next question fine a 50 year old man is scheduled for anterior cervical fusion okay there is some surgery on the neck the patient is placed on a ventilator during surgery the moment uh, you know some students they tell me sir the moment they say ventilator i will get panic attack why because you know most of the times as an intern i also when i was an intern i was not looking at the ventilator but yes if you are an intern looking at this video please make sure it's not a big or you know it's not a complex device it's a very simple device so just go it you are using smartphones you are smart people it's a very you know old machine where you can press the button connect it to a test lung and see how it is ventilating you will understand everything beautifully we have made a separate section on ventilatory management if you have not seen this just go through that video see that ventilator you will be understanding it right so the patient is placed on ventilator at the beginning of the surgery the peak airway pressure is noted to be around 20 okay with an oxygen saturation of 99 spo2 value of 99 percent on pulse oximeter a hour later the peak airway pressure has increased to 40 centimeters of water saturation is falling what could be the reason what could be the reason very very important mcq for your entrance examination they can ask you this kind of question so what is happening here very simply i am put it there is decrease in saturation what is the clue he is telling there is increased in airway resistance 
what is the cause for increase in airway resistance so first thing as i said you identify the cause there can be numerous causes during surgery why there is an increased airway resistance let me put it in a very simple format then you will understand it the first cause is because it is the anterior cervical surgery surgeon might be twisting his neck like this not only his neck he will also twist the patient neck also okay so if you twist the patient neck then the tube will be compromised so mechanical obstruction mechanical obstruction this is causing increased airway resistance very important this is due, due to kinking or pressure of the surgeon's hand or etc right so this is very important cause for increased airway resistance okay no one will ask you this mcq what they will ask you is inadvent in advent bronchial intubation you don't want to intubate endobronchially but what has happened is during surgical procedure you have not fixed the endotracheal tube inside very very important the tube has migrated slightly to the right side so this is called as endobronchial intubation and the classic thing why i put this question you know in 2021 ini set examination there was a question on increased airway resistance that's the reason if you go back and see pyqs you will understand why i kept this one so inadvert bronchial intubation or endobronchial intubation this also increases airway obstruction so this also increases increased airway resistance okay then what is the third reason for increased airway resistance suppose there can be is an asthmatic it has not mentioned but there can be chances of bronchospasm there can be chances of bronchospasm this is very very important fourth one again less probability but rule out pneumothorax rule out pneumothorax very very important in pneumothorax the classical presentation is increased airway resistance okay or mechanical obstruction mechanical obstruction if i say that means not only endotracheal tube even at the tubings also when there is a connection between endotracheal tube and the ventilator there are tubings are there so those tubings also they can cause increased airway resistance or any secretions secretions in the airway or mucus in the airway mucus plug is there or endotracheal tube is blocked endotracheal tube is blocked so these are all cause these can cause increased airway resistance okay so suppose if there is a supraglottic airway supraglottic airway and if it is like lma if it is not properly placed also not properly placed now all these words very very important properly placed what do you mean by properly placed i gave this in the video section so if you are putting the endotracheal uh, lma the tip should be above the esophageal sphincter the side walls should be on the piriform fossa and the topmost portion is below the epiglottis okay so not properly placed supraglottic airway so if it is also not placed then also there can be chances of uh, uh, increased airway resistance also so or if there is some tumors this is very obvious right tumors on the neck or if it is a thyroid surgery or if it is a tonsillectomy surgery so surgeon is doing something near my endotracheal tube so this can be causing tumors on the neck causing compression of the airway or compression of the things this will also increase the airway resistance so these are the possible options for here most commonly it can be due to inadvent bronchial intubation my target here is not to give you a diagnosis but to tell you various other reasons for increased airway resistance now how to rule out this one this is your job okay so if it is a bronchospasm already we have discussed it so musical note v is present if it is a pneumothorax decrease the air entry on one side uh, tympanic note on percussion etc you can secretions in the airway now uh, if there is partial obstruction to the tube very importantly they will ask you how do you identify how do you identify whether there is a partial obstruction or not can you identify it without keeping a stent yes i can identify it how can i identify i already told you etco2 in the etco2 wave form this is the normal wave form so in the etco2 there is increased upstroking in the phase 3 
we have discussed it already i told you in the previous question also what are the uses of capnography to identify bronchospasm i told you right so there is an increased upstroking there is an increased upstroking of the phase 3 portion of endo etco2 curve so this is causing by looking at the etc what to curve you can identify yes there is some problem so if it is a mechanical obstruction if the surgeon is putting his hand like this on the endotracheal tube definitely there will be increase the airway so my alarms on the ventilator will go on ting 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 so you can identify or know it you can look at the patient if the chest wall movement is good that means you have ruled out pneumothorax if the chest wall movement is not good only one side is moving too excessively you auscultate there and see only air entry is present on that side that means it is endobronchial intubation if the chest wall is moving unequally but there is no air entry on that affected side that means there can be chances of pneumothorax also so you have to identify it basing on the clinical description i have just given very superficial description for this question but make sure they will put a question so these are all the possible complication bronchospasm or secretions or mucus plug obstruction so all these are the reasons for the increased airway resistance so if it is bronchospasm what is your treatment inhaled beta 2 agonist if it is a mechanical obstruction remove that mechanical obstruction so even in aspiration pneumonia even in aspiration pneumonia also aspiration also it can increase the airway resistance so these are all mixed one something related to mechanical factors something related to lung factors etc so depending on the question you should be able to identify these complications and once you identify the complications i think e diagnosing treatment is not a very big thing right so you know off late what is happening is they are not asking the treatment if you are looking for the treatment you know you might be falling into a trap so they are asking how do you identify the problem that's very important okay so these are some of the questions which i wanted to put a word on it so that you will understand how the questions are and especially i made these questions basing on the you know as i said you on the recent patterns of the mcqs that have been asked so various complications possibilities of complications we have discussed so that you know it acts like a revision session apart from our routine video lectures this acts like a revision session hope this helps you and at the end of the day what i can say is practice more questions in this way the only way you can conquer this examination is by doing more number of mcqs and that too clinical oriented mcqs this will give you more insight to the subject Okay wishing you all the very best I'll conclude this session here thank you